Well, I hope you've been paying attention to what you've been singing because um, you have been set up for the text that is uh, before us this morning. My name is Sammy Barton. I'm the church plant resident, and it's fun this year, especially for me to, to turn the calendar over to the year 2024 because, Lord willing, this is the year that we will plant a new church down in Livermore. And um, I'm excited about that. There's a, there's a group of people who have been, have been meeting already down there, and uh, it seems like the Lord is really blessing that work, and, and, uh, and we're gaining some momentum for that. So if you live down in the Tri-Valley area and are interested in checking out what we're doing, we're actually going to start meeting here uh, as, as kind of a Sunday school class, um, second service in room 118 just over here, uh, starting next week. So again, if you live in the Tri-Valley area, you want to check that out and see what, what the Lord is doing with um, this group and this, this new church that we pray he will, he will bring into formation, uh, and you can come check that meeting out starting next week, and we'll be meeting second service for the foreseeable future until we plan to launch in September. As, uh, as Ken mentioned, I, I did have the privilege of preaching last year on New Year's Day, and last year on New Year's Day, I, I asked you a question, and I don't expect that you to remember it, um, but the question that I asked last year was, what are you for? What are you for in 2023? As in what cause, what goal, what mission are you going to give yourself to? What are you going to work for and towards in 2023? And we looked at Titus 1.1 1, 1 a year ago. And here's, okay, raise your hand if you, if you memorize Titus chapter 1 and you, you could say Titus 1.1 1, 1 with me right now. Just like, you can just give me like a little hand. It doesn't have to be like a high hand. Okay, I got, I got a couple little hands there. All right, Titus, Titus 1 1, Paul says that he is a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ for two things for the faith of God's elect and for their knowledge of the truth that leads to or accords with godliness. So, those are the two things that I brought to you last year and said, hey, let's be for these two things. One, the faith of God's elect, that people, the unbelievers around us, we would be working for them to believe the gospel, come to faith in Christ and be saved. And then that would be working for the sanctification of ourselves and for the believers around us, uh, that, that we would grow in the knowledge of the truth that that would produce godliness in our lives. Those are the two things we looked at last year on New Year's Day. And I, I pray, I hope that this year, 2023, has been a year where you can say, yeah, I was for those two things. I worked for those two things, and I could see the progress in that. This year, heading into 2024, wrapping up 2023, I want to ask you a different question, and it's up here on the screen. What do you want from God in 2024? What do you want from God in 2024? Or what do you want God to do for you? in 2024. If that question sounds kind of familiar, it should. Pastor Kent preached from the end of Matthew 20 just a few weeks ago, and, and in that passage, there's two blind men who call out to Jesus as he's passing through the city, and, and Jesus stops, and he, he says to them, what do you want me to do for you? Kind of a similar question. You might also recognize this question. It's, it's kind of like the question that God asks Solomon in 1 Kings 3. God appears to Solomon and, and asks, asks him, ask me, what shall I give you? And I just want to, I want to pose that question to you. If, if, if God were to ask you right now on the eve of 2024, what do you want me to do for you this coming year? What would you answer? What would you say? What is it? What is it that you would want God to do for you? That's a very important question because to a great degree, what you want from God in 2024 is going to define and determine how you view God at the end of 2024. To demonstrate that, let me, let me rephrase my question a little bit. This question, what do you want from God in 2024? I could also ask it this way. 
what would it look like? What would it look like for God to be good to you in 2024? As you sit here in your seat right now, and in your estimation, as you think forward into the future, and maybe even as you look back on this past year, what would it look like for God to be good to you? How would you know that God had been good to you? What are the kinds of things that if you sit here a year from now, you would, you would look back and you'd be able to say, okay, yeah, yeah, I, I can see God's goodness to me. And I can see it here and here and here and here. And I can know that God has been good to me. How would you measure God's goodness to you in the coming year? Just another way of asking this question. What do you want from God in 2024? I just want to, I want to, wrap up this year and transition into next year by looking at this passage that helps us to realign our view of what we should want and actually what we can expect from God so that we can see and treasure his true goodness in our lives this year. And so to do that, I want to I open to one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible, it's Psalm 73. So open your Bibles to Psalm 73 and let me pray and ask for God's help as we dive into this passage. Father, do what you alone can do. And even as we're gonna look right now, God, I, I, I just pray that all, all of the things we're going to see in this passage, would you do them? Would you do them in our hearts even now? as we read and as we listen. God, be, please be good to us, even now in the ways that you have told us you want to, to do us the greatest good that you could possibly do for us. Be at work even now, God. Please help me to Proclaim your truth in a way that just, just even does justice a little bit to the beauty of this passage, and what you've inspired here, the things that you have here for the, the help and the edification of your saints. And God, for those here who need a, a little bit of a reminder, need our hearts realigned to your true goodness. Would you help that, God? Help, help us in that. And for those who, who even now see and know many of the things that this, this psalm teaches, would you just cause us to be stirred up again with a reminder? Be good to us right now, God, please, for the sake of your name and your son. We pray it in Jesus' name the ultimate expression of your goodness. Amen. All right, Psalm, Psalm 73. Psalm 73 is just a beautifully organized passage. In fact, I'd say it's probably one of the most tightly and most beautifully structured and organized passages I've ever studied in depth. And one of my favorite things about this passage is that it's really built around this sense of, of drama in suspense regarding the fate of the author. And all of that drama and suspense, the conflict in this story, if you will, revolves around the author's perception of the goodness of God to him. Let me, let me show you what I mean. The psalmist really in the first half of the psalm is wrestling with two questions. Here's two questions up on the screen. Is God truly good? And if God is truly good, then who is God truly good to? And the psalm starts off with what you might call like a flash forward. You can probably think of a movie that does this where at the beginning of the movie, before they show you anything else, they actually show you like, this, hey, this is how it's going to end. Or they show you a little piece of how the movie is going to end, a little part of the conclusion in order to get you hooked. She's like, whoa, whoa, that was crazy. How, how did we get there? That's exactly how the psalmist starts here. He starts by giving you his ultimate conclusion 
regarding the goodness of God. And then he spends the rest of the psalm showing you the journey and taking you on the journey that he went on in order to get to that conclusion. And here right off the bat in verse 1 is his ultimate conclusion. If he's answering these questions, is God truly good? And to whom is God truly good? Here is answers. Here's his ultimate conclusion. Yes, truly God is good. Check. God's good. That's conclusion. And to who is God good? Or to whom is probably grammatically correct. Someone, someone can correct me later. God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. So the ultimate conclusion, is God good? Yes. Who is God good to? He's good to the pure in heart. Now it's important to notice what he, what he actually says. There. He says, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. And it's really important wherever we're at in our Bible, but especially when we're in the Old Testament, we have to be very careful not to take things that are written and, and promised to Israel, the nation of Israel, as the nation of Israel, okay, to take things that are promised specifically to them and rip those out of context and then apply them to us as believers and as the church, okay? We, we don't believe the church has replaced Israel or the church is synonymous with Israel. Those are separate entities in God's economy. But here, he says, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart, the distinction. The author does want to make a division. He wants to make a distinction. But the distinction and the division he wants to make regarding, okay, who, who is God actually good to? Is not the distinction between Israel and the nations or Israel and the Gentiles. The distinction that he wants to make when he, when he says, who is, God, who is God good to here? is a distinction between those who are pure in heart and those who are not. The pure in heart and this other group we're going to see down here, the wicked. Okay? So the, the point here, the focus is that God is good to people who have a certain kind of heart. He is good to those who are pure in heart. Who are the pure in heart? What does it mean to be pure in heart? Stay tuned, the psalm is gonna answer that question for us, okay? So we'll answer that as we walk through and see how the psalm plays out. So here's his ultimate conclusion. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. That's where he's ultimately going to land. But it's not, it's not a smooth journey for the author to reach that conclusion. There's a lot of bumps along the way, and that's really what the first half of this psalm is about. Because right after, right after he gives us this truth, this truth about God's goodness, that's verse one, right after that, we run into the tension around God's goodness the tension around God's goodness. And the tension here is introduced with the word, but. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart, but. That's not the word you wanted to see next. Because that introduces a contrast. God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped and my steps had nearly stumbled. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. There's this tension here that's introduced in the psalm. We have the immo immovable truth, God is good to those who are pure in heart. But what's gonna happen to the author? And the implication is this. He said he'd almost stumbled. His steps had nearly slipped. Stumbled and slipped from what? Stumbled and slipped from being pure in heart. So the author in this psalm, he's on the verge of actually walking away from being pure in heart and thereby forfeiting his experience of God's goodness. There's this tension in the psalm that is, okay, God's good, but what's going to happen to the author? Is he going to be pure in heart? Is God going to be good to him? Dramatic, this dramatic tension, suspense. 
That, that tension, that tension in the psalm, really in the plot of the psalm then, is, is driven by this tension in the mind of the psalmist. There's this tension between what the psalmist observes in the world and what he would expect to be true if God were really good, at least based on his current definition of goodness. There's this tension between what he sees out in the world and what he would expect to be true if God is really good. So what, what does he see out in the world and leads to this tension? Well, it says, I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So the psalmist looks out at the world and he observes the prosperity of the wicked. <clears throat> what particularly does he see? He tells us, he gives us his observations about the wicked here in verses 4 through 12. Here's what he sees about the wicked. He says, for they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace, and violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out from fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongues strut through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. So he looks out and he, see, he sees that this is the state of the wicked. They have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. And that's, that's health. That's health. That's the way they would talk about health back then. So the wicked, are, the wicked are healthy, and the wicked are prosperous. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. Again, their eyes swell out from fatness. Those marker, marker, these people, these people are, are healthy, they're well fed. And then down here in verse 12, he gives the summary. Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. The wicked are comfy, the wicked are comfortable. The wicked are relaxed. The wicked are living it up. They increase in riches, wealth. So look, the wicked are comfortable and healthy and wealthy. That's what the psalmist observes about the wicked, but then he observes something else. He looks at his own life. Look at verse 13. In 14, he says, All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. Stricken, stricken. The same word he, he used back up here to say the wicked, they're not stricken like the rest of mankind, but I'm stricken and I'm rebuked every morning when I am trying to keep my heart clean. So he looks at this and he says, wait a second. The wicked are prospering. The, the wicked are flourishing. And I, the one whom tr I'm, trying to, I'm trying to follow God, I'm trying to keep my heart pure, trying to keep my heart clean. I'm stricken. So it seems like the wicked prosper and those who are pure in heart are stricken and afflicted. That's the discrepancy, the tension that he observes between what he sees out in the world and what he would expect to be true, given the existence of the kind of God that the Bible describes. Now look, this is, this is proverbial, okay? This is, this is poetic genre. So the author is speaking proverbially. This isn't a universal truth. We could think of lots of examples where wicked people do not prosper, they do not flourish. In fact, their wickedness, their sin, leads them into very obvious manifestations of destruction. We could think of plenty of examples of that. We could also think of plenty of examples where righteous people, people who we would say, yeah, these people have every appearance of being pure in heart. These people are believers, and, we, and they're, doing, they're doing great, they're doing fine. Seems like their, their lives are going just swell. We could, we could think of, of plenty of examples, counterexamples to what the psalmist observes here, but the reality of the matter is this. If you, if you just 
take our culture at face value, right? If, if, you were, if you were to drop a space alien into our culture for a day, and at the end of the day you ask him, hey, <clears throat> Who are the people, who are the people here who are living large? Who are the people who are on top? Who are the people who are, who are at the pinnacle? Who are the prosperous people? The fact is that many of the most prominently prosperous people on this planet are also some of the most prominently perverse. It doesn't take a whole ton of observation to look around and say, yeah, when, when we think about wealth and power and a comfortable, easy lifestyle, the people who come probably most prominently to mind are not believers. The Kardashians of this world are not particularly known for their purity of heart. And you don't see, just see this play out in the headlines or in the box office or the TV rating, ratings, right? You, you, you see this play out in your daily life too. You can probably think of people in the workplace, in the marketplace, who have gotten ahead through dishonest means. You've, you've seen the wicked prosper in those settings. Maybe they're sitting next to you at the office. Or maybe they're your boss. You can probably think of people who you know or have known in life who have gained popularity and influence through gossip and slander and backbiting and lying. I would guess that probably the most popular people, if you, if you think back on your high school and college days, the people who were most popular and had the most influence didn't get there through purity of heart. You can probably think of people you know personally who have had, you, you look at their life and you say, this person, like they have, just, they have just hit everything along the way. Everything in their life has gone exactly right. And they are living a life of luxury and opulence while all day long they thumb their nose at God and his commands. And they, they trample roughshod over God's word. And they're proud of it just like the wicked described here, whose tongues strut across the earth. They're boasting of all that they have gained for themselves apart from God. You probably know people like that. And on the flip side, you can probably think of many believers, people who they've been faithful to God and they have suffered tremendously in this life. That, that reality right there, that presents an apparent discrepancy. There's this discrepancy between what we actually observe in the world and what we would naturally expect to see given the existence of an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good God who hates wickedness, who hates evil, and brings it to justice. You wouldn't naturally expect to see the wicked prospering given the existence of such a God. There's this tension there then between what we would expect and what we observe. And that tension is really just a variation on what is often called the problem of evil. Raise your hand if you've, if you've heard that term, you're familiar with that term, the problem of evil. Okay, probably, so most of us are probably familiar with the term, the problem of evil. If you're not familiar with that term, you've at least heard a question like this asked before. A question that sounds something like, why do bad things happen to good people? Raise your hand if you've heard a question like that before. Okay, almost 100%. Now look, that question, that question's a variation on the problem of evil. That question, I don't think it's particularly difficult to answer biblically, any way you slice it, because if you, if you take that question, why do bad things happen to good people? First of all, I'd like to say, well, if you mean like good, we just heard a few weeks ago, Jesus says, no one is good but God alone. So there are no good people. Romans 3 tells us that. So there's no such thing as, as bad things happening to good people, because in one sense, there are no good people. But even if you take good in the sense of, of righteous, 
Someone who's truly, their heart is devoted to God. They follow God. You take good in, in, in maybe more of a sense that it would appear in, uh, in the Old Testament that way. You say, well, why do, why, do good, why do bad things happen to people who follow God and love him? Well, the Bible explains that all over the place. That's not, that's not a problem. So why do bad things happen to good people? That's, that's an easy question to answer. The psalmist here, he's asking the flip side of that question. Not why do bad things happen to good people? but why do good things happen to bad people? That is the apparent discrepancy that the psalmist is wrestling with here when he looks out at the world and sees the wicked prospering. If God is really good, if God is good, then, then why, do, why is all this good stuff happening to these wicked people? And I'm afflicted. One of the things I love about the Bible is the Bible doesn't ignore the apparent discrepancy between what we see in the world and what we would naturally expect to see given the existence of the kind of God that the Bible describes. The Bible doesn't ignore that discrepancy. The Bible doesn't just sugarcoat it or paint everything rose-colored. The Bible tackles the discrepancy head on in passages just like this one. And when you accept the answer is that the Bible gives to the so-called problem of evil. The problem of evil really becomes no problem at all. It all really just boils down to having the right view of what is evil and what is truly good. But at this point, the psalmist isn't there yet. The psalmist isn't there yet. And there's probably people in your life, and maybe even some of you sitting here, who you're, you're not there yet either. And this discrepancy between what you see in the world and what you think should be true given the existence of God, that discrepancy, that tension causes tremendous turmoil inside of you. And that's actually what we see here. The tension leads to turmoil. The tension about God's goodness leads to this turmoil surrounding God's goodness in the heart and the mind of the psalmist. And in fact, because of this tension, this discrepancy, the psalmist is really here on the brink of walking away from God altogether. And the reason is that because of his observations of the world, he has reached a wrong conclusion about God's goodness. He's about to walk away from God because he's reached a wrong conclusion about God's goodness. If you look here in verse 13, um, the ESV doesn't translate it, but if you have an NASB, it does translate in Hebrew. Verse 13 starts with the same word that verse 1 started with, the word truly. Sorry, that is completely illegible. Um, but you know what it says, truly. Truly, all in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. And so he wants to draw this contrast between the truth that he stated at the beginning, the true conclusion, the ultimate conclusion he stated at the beginning, and the false conclusion, the wrong conclusion that he comes to based on his observation of the world. And, and the conclusion he, he comes to is basically this, hey, it's pointless to follow God. It's in vain to have a pure heart. It does nothing for my life to have a pure heart. That's what he says. All in vain have I kept my heart clean. And there's a connection there. Pure in heart, heart clean. So if you, if you reframe what he's saying there in terms of his original conclusion, what he, what he, where he's at here in verse 13 is basically saying this. Hey, I've looked at the world and here's the conclusion I've come to. God isn't good to the pure in heart. I've, I've kept my heart clean. It hasn't done anything for me except that I've been stricken. So God isn't good to the pure in heart. God is good to the wicked. That's the conclusion he comes to here in the middle of the psalm based on his observation. The exact opposite of what he stated back in verse 1. God isn't good to the pure in heart. 
God is good to the wicked, so it's pointless to follow God. It's pointless to try to keep your heart pure. Don't, don't miss what's happening here, okay? What's happening here is that the author has misidentified God's goodness. The author has misidentified the goodness of God. Why? Because he wants the wrong things from God. Or at least he's misprioritized what he really wants from God. He looks around and he looks at what the wicked have. He says, the wicked are healthy, wealthy, and comfortable, and safe, and secure. And the, they, have all of, they have all of these earthly things, and that these things look good. These are good things. And God has given those things to them, but he has not given those things to me. Therefore, God is good to the wicked and not to me. He says, that's, I look at the wicked and that's really what they have is really what I want from God. Health and wealth, prosperity, comfort and ease. That's what I want from God. And if God were good to me, then I'd have those things. But God's actually good to the wicked because they have those things. He's misidentified God's goodness and because of that, he's actually on the brink of walking away from God altogether. Because he wants God to give him what the wicked have. That's what he wants from God. What do you really want from God? What do you really want from God? What would it be like? What would it be like for God to be good to you in your estimation? Here's what I find really interesting. He's on the brink of apostasy, right? He's on the brink of walking away from God. In verse 15, look at what he says about it. He's reached this conclusion. God's not really good to the pure in heart. God's good to the wicked. Verse 15, he says, if I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. So he says, look, I've reached this conclusion, but I can't talk about it with anybody. You know why? You know, you know who Asaph is? Asaph, the author of this psalm? Asaph is the worship leader for all of Israel. What, what, would, it, what would it have cost him? What would have been the fallout for this guy? If he, if he had come out and said, you know what, everybody, here's my conclusion. Uh, it's pointless to follow God. It doesn't do you any good to follow God. God's not really good to the pure in heart. God's good to the wicked. And so I kind of, I'm just going to go be like them. He couldn't say that. It would have cost him way too much to say that. And it's, just, it's just curious and it's sobering for me to read that verse and just wonder how many people in this room are quietly giving up on following God? How many people in this room are quietly reaching the conclusion that following God really isn't worth it and, and having a pure heart really isn't worth it because it really doesn't make that much of a difference anyway? But you can't say that because it would cost you way too much in terms of relationships to say something like that. And so you just quietly live like that in here, even though you can't talk about it with anybody else. If that's you, maybe you should find somebody to talk about that with. Maybe. I have to say maybe there. I actually can't say that authoritatively from this psalm because that's not the point here. But if that's you, I, I can tell you this 
with authority from God's word. If that's you, if you are quietly, if you are quietly questioning, if you are quietly saying, yeah, I don't know if this is really worth it. I don't know if having a pure heart is worth it at all. This passage is here to help you. This psalm is here to help you and show you how somebody walked through this exact same thing, this exact same question, this exact same doubt that came to almost the brink of walking away from God. This passage is here to help you. It's here to straighten you out again. And I can also tell you about how Asaph ultimately came out of that place. He came out of that place of doubt. It's a good reminder for the rest of us too, who maybe aren't struggling that way, to tell you do not come to that place. Look at, look at what he says here in verse 16. Verse 16 is very interesting. He said, but when I thought how to understand all this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. This word right here, the word for thought. How did, how did Asaph get to this place? How did the worship leader of all of Israel, who's supposed to be leading the congregation, is ultimately an, is it gonna write scripture? How did this guy get to this place of intense doubt and almost to the brink of apostasy, questioning God's goodness? That word for thought, is, is a math word. It's the word for, for counting or calculating something. Asaph got here by calculating in his own head. Asaph got to this place of doubt by taking his own observations of the world and using those as his starting point and those as his authority to, uh, to, to, to be the standard of truth. And then he sat there and said, okay, now I got my observations. Let me calculate it all out. Let me, let me use my own reasoning and my own wisdom and my own insight and my own smarts to try to figure out what the truth really is based on my observations of the world. That's how he got there. He tried to calculate it all out himself with his own reasoning. Folks, we, we cannot start with our own reasoning and our own observations of the world as our authority for what is true. That's backwards. And I've, and I've seen so many people do it. I've talked to so many people who, who reason this very way where they basically say, okay, I look at the world and I see that, that this, this, and this are not good by my standard of good. Therefore, if this, this, and this are not good by my standard of good, then therefore God must not be good because this, this, and this are not good. That's backwards reasoning. That's reasoning from your observations of the world and then drawing conclusions about God from your observations. Don't go that direction. That's what Eve did in the garden. That's what Eve did with the fruit, right? God had already spoken about the fruit. God had already said, that's not good for you. Don't eat it. But Eve, she looked at it and she made observations about it. And, and she said, you know, no, 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 that looks, that looks good to me. So God must be wrong about it. So she said, her own reasoning and her own observation above God's word as the authority for what is true. Don't go that direction. It's backwards. Start with what God's word says and use that as the lens through which you view all of your observations about the world. Because the Bible says God is good and God does good. And so you take that as your starting point and you look at the world and say, okay, if, if, if the Bible says this, God is good, then I look at this, this, and this, it doesn't look good to me, but I accept what God says that somehow that's good and it's gonna work out for good. Don't reason the wrong way from your observations back to God. Reason from God's word out 
to the world. Or else you'll get stuck like Asaph, calculating, trying to figure it all out yourself with your own reasoning. You end up questioning and doubting. So don't, don't trust your own calculations. Submit yourself to the authority of God's word. And look at verse 17. Here's the turning point for Asaph. He was thinking this way. He was questioning God, doubting God, calling into question God's goodness. Until, what a beautiful word. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. And then I discerned their end. If you're wrestling, struggling, know somebody who is with these things, don't give up on the means of grace. Don't give up on the means of grace. I don't know about you, but there's so many times when I've been wrestling with something, struggling with something, doubting something, and I've just come to church, or I've just had a conversation with another brother, or I've just cracked open my Bible and started reading. Or I've just sat down to pray. And I don't get any, I don't get any farther than the word Father. And all of a sudden, whatever I was wrestling with or struggling with or doubting or it didn't make sense, whatever, suddenly it makes sense. Or if it doesn't make sense, suddenly it's not that big of a deal anymore. That's not magic. It's means. So what theologians call the means of grace. God has told us, hey, these are the ways that I'm gonna work in your life. These are the things that I'm gonna use to do work in your life. Don't give up on those things. God's word, prayer, fellowship, the preaching of the word, the communion of the saints. Don't give up on those things, even if you are wrestling and doubting, because those are the ways that God is actually going to bring clarity back into your life. And even if, I mean, think about Asaph, right? Think about Asaph going into the temple to lead worship with all these doubts in his heart. You can imagine that seemed pretty mechanical. Even if it seems mechanical to you, you're like, I don't feel like doing this. But God, you said to do it, so I'm going to do it. Even that's an act of faith. Don't give up on the things that God has said, hey, I'm going to use this to bring you back. We don't know how, but God worked to bring clarity to Asaph and turn him back around just when he entered the sanctuary, presumably to, to go do his job. And when he did, God brought clarity to him. When he did, he realized the truth. It's really, it's just it's a very sudden shift, right? He's in this place of extreme turmoil until verse 17, until I went to the sanctuary. Then I discerned their end. Then I realized the truth. <laughs> what did he realize? Right, he's looking around at the wicked and he's saying, okay, the w- God it seems like God is good to the wicked because they have all these things that I want. I wish, I want God to give those things to me. So God must be good to the wicked. He's not good to me. But he realized the real truth about what appeared to be God's goodness to the wicked. Verse 18, truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. What's the truth about God's supposed goodness to the wicked. You look around, the wicked are prospering, the wicked are flourishing. Is that really good? Is that really God being good to the wicked? 
Here's what it says here. Truly you set them in slippery places. The word for slippery is the word for false footing. It's related to the word for deception. Here's what, here's what Asaph is saying. It says, God sets the wicked in slippery places. God sets the wicked on false footing. Now again, this is proverbial, so we don't, I don't know when God is doing this and when he's not, but sometimes when you see the wicked prospering, God is actually making them comfortable so that they really have no need to turn to him and justice will be done in the end. He's making them say, okay, yeah, there's nothing wrong here. This is good. My life's good. My life's fine. I got everything I want. But actually, God has put them on a slippery place. And one day, he will make them fall to ruin. It's very sobering. And again, I don't, look, I don't know. I had a discussion about this with, uh, with some folks between service. I don't, look, I, don't, I don't know when God is doing that or when God is working in somebody's life to a wicked person to bring them towards salvation. I don't know. I don't know who's who here, or not here, but in the world. But sometimes when you see the wicked prospering, that's what God's doing. He's setting them in slippery places. And that right there just helps us remember what looks good to you may not actually be good. Or at least good in the way that you would want good to be done to you. Is God good to the wicked? I mean, Psalm 145 says that the Lord is good to all and his mercies are over all of his works, okay? Throughout the Bible, even, even the rain, the rain that we had these past few days is, is called out as a manifestation of God's goodness to people in general. God gives even the wicked oftentimes food and clothing and gives life and breath to all things. So is God good to the wicked? In some sense, the Bible says yes, he is. But folks, that's not the goodness I want from God. That's, 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 not, that's not the way I want God to be good to me. The wicked, the wicked can have the wealth and health and prosperity and possessions and the comfort and the ease and all that. I, I want more from God than that. I need more from God than that. I need more from God than money or health or a warm bed or discretionary time to go, to go have hobby. I, I need more from God. I want more from God than those things. So what, what do you really want from God? What should you really want from God? If the ultimate manifestations of God's goodness are not money and wealth and power and fame and influence, what does it look like for God to be good to you in 2024? Look here at verses 21 through 24. I just want to show you something really beautiful in this psalm. It says this, When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. That's the psalmist talking to God. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. There's something really cool here. That word with you right there in this toward you. He says, I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I'm continually with you. Those two phrases are identical in Hebrew. 
okay? And so what the author wants you to do is he wants you to take those two lines and he wants you to place them on top of each other and see them as simultaneous. I was a beast towards you, God. I was a brute towards you. I was ignorant and stupid and selfish and just like a, just like a witless animal that bites the hand that feeds it. That's how I was toward you, God. And at the same time, while I was like that, I was with you and you were with me. And all that time while I was doubting and my feet were almost slipping and stumbling and I was almost flying off the rails, God, that whole time, you had me by the hand and you led me out of it. That's the goodness of God. The goodness of God to take hold of your hand through all of your stupidity and my stupidity and sin in the countless ways that I mistreat God every single day and forget him and do not give him the glory or the acknowledgement that he deserves and the ways that my heart is prone to wander and pursue worldly things. For God, through all of that, to take me by the hand, even when I don't know it, and to lead me out and to lead me back to him. And actually, as it says here, to lead me all the way home to glory. For God to do that my whole life, through every time that I'm in danger of slipping away, falling away, for God to have a hold of my hand and take me all the way home. That's what I want God to do for me. To hold my right hand and guide me with his counsel all the way to glory. So what do you really want from God? You want God to take you by the hand and lead you all the way home. You also want God to cause you to desire him more. Look at verse 25. This is what the author comes to realize. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Think about the contrast there. Think about the contrast between verse two, where the author was at the beginning of the psalm, and here. Verse two, he says, I'm envious of the arrogant when I see the prosperity of the wicked. I look at the, the wicked, I look at the arrogant, and I say, I want, I desire what they have. I desire all these earthly things that the wicked and the arrogant have. And here, God has, has gotten his heart back aligned to where he says, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. All that wealth and possessions and fame and God, what I want is you. Folks, there is nothing more precious. There is nothing more valuable than for God to do that for you. There is nothing more precious, more valuable on the face of this planet than for God to take your heart and to make himself more and more and more valuable in your estimation, to make you treasure him more and more and more and more so that you can sing the song that we sing I trade my treasure and all my reward, Jesus, to know you and know you more. Paul says, the knowing Christ is of surpassing value. It is the most valuable thing in the universe for you to know Christ. And Paul doesn't pull that out of thin air. Jeremiah 9, let not the wise man boast in his, in his wisdom. Not, let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. That is the most valuable thing you could possibly have. 
to know God in Christ and for God to make you want to know him more, to cause you to desire him and know him more. That is the greatest thing outside of giving you his son in the first place. It is the greatest thing that God can possibly do for you. If you, at the end of 2024, I do not know what God will do in 2024, I do not know all the things that will happen to you or to me. And I do not say this lightly. I say this with great conviction from God's word. If you, at the end of 24, desire God, if God is more valuable to you at the end of 2024 than he was at the beginning, then God has been supremely good to you. I assume this is where John Piper gets the name of his ministry from this verse, desiring God. Earth has nothing I desire besides you. Just encourage, if, it, if, it's been, if it's been a while or maybe you've never picked up uh, one of John Piper's books, um, pick up at the beginning of this year, desiring God, or when I don't desire God, how to fight for joy, or the dangerous duty of delight, or pretty much any other John Piper book because they all say the same thing. And just be reminded of this truth, that it is the greatest thing, it is the best thing for you, and it is actually the best thing for God's glory. It is the best thing God can do for you to cause you to desire him more than anything else and to keep conforming your heart to be more like verse 25. The last thing is this. What do you want God to do for you? I want to strengthen your heart against worldliness and temptation. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. To be the strength of his heart, right? What's, what's been the drama throughout this psalm? God is good to those who are pure in heart, but the author almost fell away from being pure in heart. But what did God do for him? God kept his heart pure. God led him back to purity of heart. And purity in heart in this psalm, I think, is basically just this. The pure in heart are those who truly love and desire God more than this world. You need God to be, as we sang earlier, the strong defender of your weary heart. You need God to protect your heart from worldliness and temptation and to keep you this year from becoming like Demas, who having loved this present world, walked away from God. Or being like the soil where the seed falls in it and the thorns and the, the, the temptations and the seductions of wealth come and choke it out. You need God to be a mighty fortress for you, to be the strength of your heart against those things. He's the only one who can give you that pure heart to begin with, and he's the one who can keep it pure. He wraps up here. He comes right back to where we're at the beginning. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But to me, it is good. This is the same phrase from verse two. But as for me, and he takes these things that were in tension at the beginning of the psalm and he brings them together. But for me, it is good to be near God. Would you make it your prayer that whatever else God does for you this year, he will do these things. He'll magnify his worth and value in your estimation and bring you back to himself always and keep you near to him, even when you are prone to wander. That is the goodness 
that I want from God this year. And that's what will make a happy new year for us all. Father, would you please, please do what this psalm describes for us. Would you please, each and every one of us here who knows you, take us by the hand, God, as you have taken us by the hand, and you guide us with our counsel. But God, lead us, please, through another year. Lead us, please, in faithfulness to you and in purity of heart. Keep our hearts pure. Increase for us, God, our desire for you. Increase the magnitude of your great worth in our eyes. And do it for your glory in Christ. So please be good to us in this way this year, God. We ask it because we know it's the way that you have most passionately designed to be good to us is to make yourself greater in our hearts and our minds. So please do it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy New Year, everybody.